Arsene Wenger seized the championship from Manchester United last season as Sir Alex Ferguson was forced to take a back seat. This year, the Barclaycard English Premier League will provide one of the great sporting comebacks. Managers, young and old, will provide a tense, dramatic and passionate season. You could say the cycle of a team is five years. What is important is to achieve as much as you can, as long as this team is in form and has a chance to win it. So Alex has won eight championships, Man United in the last 10 years, so I think what he has done is tremendous and everybody would dream to do that. In August, Arsene Wenger made his intentions clear. To be considered as good as Manchester United, Arsenal needed to win back-to-back -back championships. But they lacked the financial muscle to match their main rival. Only Gilberto Silva and Pascal Siegel were added to the squad for a total of six and a half million pounds. But despite that quiet summer, Highbury remained home to a squad rich in quality. Newly promoted Birmingham were the first visitors to North London and the Gunners turned on the style. Brave performance from the Blues did little to prevent the inevitable. Thierry Henry scored their first goal after nine minutes. And then Sylvain Wiltord added a second after 24 minutes to seal a comfortable victory. One game, maximum points. By the end of August, they'd scored nine goals in just three matches. Stung by Arsenal's capture of their title at Old Trafford, Manchester United suffered finishing third behind Liverpool. The players' hunger and desire for trophies would determine whether they would strike back immediately. We need to uh, raise ourselves after the disappointment of last year. Uh, I think uh, United is a club which should win titles every year and I think uh, that's what we're aiming for. It was a satisfactory opening day, Solskjaer scoring the only goal against newly promoted West Bromwich Albion. Determination on display from players and fans alike. What side do you Arsenal fans and Liverpool? After finishing second, Liverpool spent big. £18.7 million pounds on Bruno Sheru and Senegalese World Cup stars Elad Juf and Salif Jao. Liverpool is about winning trophies and about winning silverware, whatever it is. And uh, I think the players are eager to come back to that. So Bobby Robson would celebrate his 70th birthday mid-season, but with a Champions League campaign to look forward to, there was no time for rest. I'm highly motivated. I get up every morning and want to go to work. I don't get up every morning and want to go to the supermarket with my wife. Um, and I don't want to go on the golf course. Um, I, I, don't want, I don't want to sit at home and read the papers all day or watch television. I want to work. I'm doing what I want to do. The team are also doing what the boss wanted. An impressive 4-0 home victory over West Ham put them top of the table after the first weekend. But to many people's surprise, it was Tottenham who set the early season pace. Robbie Keane arrived from Leeds for £7 million at the end of August and saw Spurs go top of the table by beating Southampton 2-1. We're happy to be, at this moment, for 24 hours, top of the league. But uh, we know there's a lot more hard work. Making the headlines in August, Roy Keane returned to the Manchester United lineup following his World Cup bust up. Ireland boss Mick McCarthy had sent Keane home. And on Merseyside, El Hadj Juf scored his first goals for Liverpool in the 3 0 defeat of Southampton. He'd have to wait seven months before another league goal. Leeds versus Manchester United is one of the matches in any Premiership calendar. One man was under the spotlight in September's game. Rio Ferdinand became the world's most expensive defender in the summer in a £30 million move to Manchester. 
tensions rose after Leeds chairman Peter Ridsdale claimed Ferdinand was only ever a stand-in for Jonathan Woodgate. I've just of the opinion that um, once the deal is done, we should just keep our mouth shut and just get on with our football. Sir Alex Ferguson was more than satisfied with his close-season acquisition. Yes, uh, delighted. Rio's been fantastic. OK, he's, he missed a couple of early games because of the ankle injury, but uh, he's played in the last two matches. He's been outstanding and we're very pleased with him. New Leeds boss Terry Venables was less happy. He'd replaced David O'Leary on the understanding that Ferdinand wouldn't be sold. It was the first in a series of disappointments. Transfers that were going to go through didn't go through. So really they was in a, a predicament that they had to, they had to do it. And uh, it was a big blow. But there you are, that's, that's, you've got to go with the blows, haven't you? Les Blase were the Leeds fans who'd seen a player leave for their most hated rivals. I don't know what decibel level of, of hatred will come out there, but uh, it'll be very, very noisy. But um, we all handle it. It was all smiles pre-match for the 23-year-old from South London as he made his way to some unfamiliar surroundings. Rio Ferdinand, now of Manchester United in England, comes out into the den. It was to prove a nightmare return as Harry Kuehl scored the only goal of the game. Manchester United's second consecutive defeat to leave them in ninth position. You just have to dig in at this moment in time. It's not easy, but that's what character comes into it, and I think they've got a character OK. It had been a great summer for football supporters in the Midlands. Steve Bruce's Birmingham were promoted after a dramatic penalty shootout in the First Division playoff final, and Gary Megson's West Bromwich Albion captured the second automatic promotion spot behind Manchester City. Of the two... Birmingham probably had the better resources to succeed, but Bruce knew that success would have to come cheaply. What we're all conscious of is that we didn't, in no disrespect to the other clubs in there, we don't want to end up like Derby and Leicester and, and Coventry and Sheffield Wednesday, Notts Forest, that we're going to go out and just blow it all, um, because I don't think that's correct. The top flight. Obviously, we got those wins, which meant there was a little bit of um, self-belief came about the place. Um, but we are still in a, in a, in a curve of learning where we're, uh, we're trying to uh, get it better. The last of those victories came against Southampton. The Baggies didn't win again for nine games and would remain in or around the bottom three for the rest of the season. For more than 20 years, the preeminent team in the Midlands had been Aston Villa. A league title and European Cup had placed them at football's top table. Last season, though, the club finished eighth, its lowest position for five years, and after two wins from their first five games of this campaign, the title of the Midlands' top club was up for grabs. In the first top-flight derby for 17 years, the game was a predictable mix of passion, aggression and a little skill. And to the delight of the blue side of Birmingham, the underdogs scored a notable 3-0 victory. All of a sudden, that will, that will come up and he'll not know it's coming. And that has to take a lot of character to deal with those kind of... I've been there, I know what it's like. You feel genuinely sorry for the lad, you know, but in a game like it is, you need that bit of luck and that little bit of luck on the night with a with mistake like the big goalkeeper made, went our way. Middlesbrough were flying high in September. The team were third in the month's final week, following an impressive 3-0 demolition of Spurs at White Hart Lane. And Junichi Inamoto became the first Japanese player to score in the Premiership. This goal against Sunderland was his second in two matches. Gerard Ullier made his intentions clear in the summer. Do better than last season. If the Merseyside Giants were going to achieve that, it would mean capturing their first title in 13 years. They got off to a wonderful start. 12 games without defeat made Ullier's ambition a real possibility. Terry Venable's struggling lead side were the victims in mid-October as the Reds strode to the head of the table in a midday kickoff. Critics claim Liverpool were winning despite playing poorly, often the sign of a side destined to win the league. At least, that's what the boss thought. 
would say, uh, Premiership uh, uh, champion potential. Uh, I know Arsenal are doing well. At least we're top of the league for a couple of hours. Julier's Reds would stay on course for the title until November. Across Stanley Park, Everton have become used to looking at their neighbours with envious eyes. But the blue half of Merseyside was witnessing a new dawn. Under the guidance of manager David Moyes, Everton's star was once again in the ascendancy. And in his team, he had the Premiership's brightest prospect. Oh, he went for it! Oh! Incredible! Moyes, who won the prestigious Manager of the Year award, they brought the belief back to the Everton fans. It's tough to be here to believe what's actually going on. You know, it's, it's incredible. And, you know, as a manager, uh, you thrive on that as well. And the players are thriving on it also, you know, they're, they're so, so pleased we're doing well. And, you know, it's just as if you're, you're bringing something back to life again. Peter Reid won the great sack race in October. Sunderland had won just two of their first nine. Enter surprise replacement Howard Wilkinson with an obvious objective. We have got to get away from that relegation area as quickly as possible. The impact of Asian players on the Premiership continued. Manchester City's Sun Ji Hai became the first Chinese player to score in England's top flight. Peter Schmeichel was looking forward to November's Manchester derby more than most. The former United hero would announce his retirement from football later in the year, so this would be the last season he would face his old club. But United icon or not, he always had a soft spot for the Blues. When I was here first time around, uh, I know I play for Man United, but most of my friends were Blues. So I, I never had sort of that uh, hate relationship with the Blues. November's game was to be the last league meeting between these old rivals at Main Road. The Blues were due to move to the multi-million pound City of Manchester Stadium for the 2003-2004 season. A massive game then, for many reasons. Obviously Saturday, it's sort of like going into the lion's den. Um, the last game at Main Road, they'll be um, wanting to make sure that they go out on a high. I don't think they've beaten us for a long time. and. They'll be aware of the rewards if they do. They've got a lot of quality now, Manchester City. Probably the most quality that they've had since I um, started playing against them seven or eight years ago. Stand by for an explosion of noise. City did look determined to win the last derby match at Main Road and inflict a defeat on neighbours who'd lost just once in the last 12 competitive matches. It was the highlight of City's season. They have all these games in Europe um, against the Valencias and Real Madrids. So, you know, the pedigree is unbelievable. But today, I honestly believe we deserve the victory. And I think our fans can go and have a great night. The most prolific striker in Premiership history. A hero for his country and every club he's represented. Now, an idol in his hometown. Since retiring from international football to prolong his club career, Alan Shearer's been living the dream. It was all I ever wanted to do was play for my hometown club. I was well aware, and still am, of what the number nine means up here in Newcastle, a centre forward. And I, I wanted to wear that number nine shirt, and um, nothing was, was, was going to derail me from, from getting that. Shearer would achieve a final tally of 17 league goals in a fabulous season. Against Manchester United, he scored his 100th Premiership goal, the first to score a century for two clubs. He became Newcastle's third highest scorer of all time and passed 300 career goals. Not surprisingly, he was named the overall player of the decade. But there was one goal that stood out from the rest. This late equaliser against Everton was voted as the goal of the season. We were struggling, we were getting beat 1-0. And um, it was one of those where if you connect with it, um, one in a hundred go in the back of the net. 
and it was just so fortunate for me that day that that one went in the back of the net because so often they go either over the stand or in the stand. Newcastle was again a hotbed of football this season. Under Sir Bobby Robson's guidance, the team would be contesting the big prize once more. The Toons' talisman was still knocking them in, with the fans as obsessive as ever. You put yourself in, in my position, a Geordie lad coming from Newcastle, captain on his side, and playing and walking out here at St James's week in, week out as captain. It doesn't get any better than that. If Newcastle wanted to be bracketed with the big two, then they had to get some sort of result at Old Trafford. They were put firmly in their place. First by Paul Scholes, and then by a hat-trick from Rude van Nistelrooy. The Dutchman's first of three during the season. While Alan Shearer was conducting business as usual on Tyneside, the man who used to clean his boots at Southampton was making his own impression on the Premiership in November. James Beattie started a hot streak that would last until the end of the season. But the 24-year-old from Lancashire wasn't accepting all the credit. The lads have got to take you know, a lot of the credit um, and for providing the chances for me, and it's just up to me to uh, not stick my way. The striker was happy, and so was the boss. But you'd never have guessed it. Gordon Strachan knew that Beatty was providing that all-important final product. All we entertain in football is shots, headers, crosses. And whichever way you get that, that's the way to play. If you're doing that, you've got a chance of winning it. If you're playing the beautiful game with lots of passing, you're not getting shots, crosses, it's a waste of time. It's all propaganda. Beatty's goals kept coming and Southampton were exceeding all expectations. By mid-January, the team was fifth and would end the season with an FA Cup final appearance. James Beattie would end the season with 23 league goals. It's good to get the chances and I love scoring goals. And uh, as I've said before, I'll just keep playing, keep smiling and enjoying myself. Other news in November, Thierry Henry helped extend Arsenal's lead at the top to four points over Liverpool with a wonderful goal against Aston Villa. But there was some good news for Graham Taylor's men as Dion Dublin scored his 100th Premiership goal against West Ham to make him one of ten centurions. This programme is sponsored by Bet365. It's me, I know. This programme is sponsored by second best. Now Arsenal had bigger fish to fry to Alex Ferguson's men by six points. Defeat was not an option for United if they were to stay in touch. Already without David Seaman, Arsenal would have further goalkeeping problems during the match. A predictably tense game, but then on 22 minutes, the deadlock was broken. They're all onside here, Veron scores, United lead. Veron's first league goal of the season, and later, cue wild celebration at Old Trafford. Scores, turn out Manchester United, that may be game set and match. It was, United now just three points behind the champions. Manchester United's victory, today for the Reds to enjoy. I'm delighted because it's there. The ability is there. The, the, the one thing we always ask them if they want it, that, you know, they can get it. They've got the ability and they've proved that time and time again. While Manchester United were making ground on the leading pack, West London was revelling in some glorious football. Chelsea, many people's dark horse contenders for the title, were beginning to fulfil some of the vast potential in their ranks. Early season was satisfactory, undefeated in the first seven, including a draw against the champions. We've got to know each other better now. They understand my mentality more, and communication has improved on and off the pitch since my English has developed. Frank Lampard had failed to live up to expectations following his £11 million transfer during the previous season. 
But in this campaign, the 24-year-old Englishman became an integral member of the team full of foreign stars. It can be easy sometimes to play with them. And uh, it's, it's something I've really realised here. You know, you learn different, different ways to play. You just give the ball to Zola sometimes and that's enough. Uh, or, or to Jimmy, you know, and that's enough. It's fantastic. It makes, you, it makes it easy. And as a team, if we're all on song, if all them players were on song, then we really should be getting right up there towards the top of the league. November finished well for the Blues with a rout of struggling Sunderland. Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank scored his fifth league goal of the season. But it was the defeat of highly rated Everton that really showed the team's potential. Chelsea were up to second, just two points off Arsenal, and with dreams of glory still very much alive. We've moved forward a lot. I think the last step is probably the belief. I think it's... Uh... It's not so much now the players we've got changing personnel or whatever the way we play. I think it's just that extra bit of belief to, to, to think that we can catch Arsenal and go above them. Uh, and once we get that week in, week out, um, I think we'll be very close. The Blues would indeed be very close. Chelsea was still in sight of a Champions League place. Across London, Charlton had turned their season around by December and Addix fans were starting to enjoy the journey to the Valley more and more as the team hauled their way up the league after a shaky start. Then they went on a run of just one defeat in 15 games, which took them to sixth place by February. Alan Kerbishley had said that survival would be the primary goal, but the form Charlton showed over the winter months meant that despite a meagre budget, a European place was within their grasp. I mean, it's the top seven, um, and we're in pole position at the moment, and being six, so it's uh, it's up to us to to just keep the run going. It was an emotional season for the South London club. Ten years ago, they'd been forced to ground share with West Ham amidst a financial crisis. Now, a decade after the club's return to the Valley, the game against Liverpool in early December marked a wonderful anniversary. Cross curtain has to stay on his line. Oh, whipped in by Jason Yule, who deserves that goal. Another save by Kirkland, but it's not over yet. And Kirkland is chipped, and Liverpool are losing 2 0. It is the Happy Valley. You know, we have been celebrating a little bit this week, and, you know, quite rightly so, because uh, we have come a long, long way. And I think playing Liverpool here to, today just rounded it all off, and we got the result as well. Approaching halfway, and no real surprises in the top four, but Everton had been transformed from relegation contenders to challenging for a place in Europe. Manchester United were climbing, but Arsenal was still in pole. In the bottom half, Charlton looked healthy, but it was looking like the three for the drop would be between West Brom, Bolton, Sunderland, and particularly the Hammers, who'd made a dismal start. England's busy Christmas period always influences events at the top and bottom of the table. The champions were just two points clear of Manchester United going into the Christmas programme. They got off to a very good start with a 2-0 victory over Middlesbrough. The losers at Upton Park on the same day would be bottom at Christmas. No team has survived that millstone. Ian Pearce got the Hammers off to the best possible start, but poor defending from West Ham allowed Michael Ricketts to equalise to leave the Hammers bottom. Manchester United needed a win at Blackburn to keep pace with the champions. It was the first time that Dwight York and Andrew Cole had partnered each other against their old club. But it was Gary Flickcroft who scored the only goal of the game on 40 minutes to leave United five points behind Arsenal. The games continued thick and fast on Boxing Day. JJ Okocha starred as Bolton scored four against Champions League chasing Newcastle. The Toon Army would celebrate a victory on the 29th to keep those hopes alive. In the meantime, Bolton were out of the bottom three. The Riverside was the Boxing Day venue for Manchester United. Things didn't get off to a good start, though. Alan Boxic opened the scoring a minute before the break. Shilard Nemeth made it two shortly after, and Joseph Desiree Job completed a 3-1 route five minutes before the end. Arsenal faced West Brom on the same day, and the Baggies got off to a great start, going ahead after just three minutes from a Dickie O header. But a goal from Francis Jeffers levelled the score shortly after half-time, and a late Thierry Henry strike meant Wenger's men were five points clear at the top. 
Terry Venables Leeds began a good run of form over Christmas. 16-year-old James Milner became the league's youngest scorer against Sunderland. With Arsenal not playing until the 29th, United had a chance to catch up against Birmingham. Diego Forlan scored his fifth league goal of the season. Then a sublime pass from Veron released Beckham, the finish worthy of the assist. The deficit two points and the pressure back on the champions. Liverpool had failed to win a game during the Christmas programme and travelled to Highbury on the 29th of December with pressure beginning to build. They were given a belated present on 70 minutes after Sol Campbell clumsily brought down Milan Baroche. Danny Murphy made no mistake from the spot. And then came the controversial moment when Liverpool claimed Francis Jeffers had dived, following minimal contact from John Arisa. A penalty was the verdict. Thierry Henry the scorer, the final outcome was that Wenger's men were three points clear at the top and looking good for successive titles. That draw at Highbury meant Liverpool slumped to sixth position after a woeful run of form saw the Reds clean only four points from a possible 27. The situation was baffling for Anfield fans as well as past Liverpool heroes. We're all disappointed. We are uh, fans of Liverpool. We want them to win. But I just think that they, they, can, they just want any sort of win to put something together to say, hang on, it's stopped now. Let's move on from there. Indicative of the slump was the loss of form of Jersey Dudek, one of the keepers of the previous season. A shaky period culminated in handing Manchester United all three points at Anfield. Suddenly you don't know why, but the confidence goes and uh, it's difficult for the players to go back on the track. Uh, there's a combination of factors, confidence, uh, sometimes decision against you that don't go your way, and sometimes also the fact that probably you have some injured players, some tired players, confidence had evaporated. Any hopes of the championship were lost at the end of February in a substandard display against Birmingham. The target now, fourth spot and a Champions League place. Ten games to play. Hope we have the same run as last season. It's usually a part of the season where we excel and when we come back and get the best of ourselves. There would indeed be another twist in the tail for Liverpool fans before the season was out. Surprisingly, Everton versus Manchester City was the most watched game worldwide, with an audience of over 300 million, primarily in China. The focal point being City's son Ji Hai, who set up their opening goal, and Everton's Lee Tier with a flick on for Thomas Rudzinski to score the 90th minute equaliser. A new innovation this year the transfer window. Clubs could only spend twice a year, from May to August and during January. It brought into sharp focus the dire financial plight of some of the Premiership's so-called bigger clubs. The biggest losers have definitely been Leeds, without question. Um, somehow it became obvious that they were desperate to sell, in a way that, say, Chelsea, who are thought to have a similar financial position to Leeds, managed to hold on to all their players. During the January window, Jonathan Woodgate was sold to Newcastle for £9 million. The Leeds fans hated it. You have a choice in life. The fans out there want a successful football team. For five years, we've delivered that. We then got it wrong. And what we've done is take the right decisions so we get it right again in the future. Surprisingly, none of the big three spent anything in the new year, banking on the squads they already had to win the silverware. Man U and Arsenal don't need anybody else, didn't need anybody else. Um, Liverpool need to qualify for the Champions League and if they start buying more players, Gerard Houllier spent a lot of money in the summer, if they start, if they start buying more players, 
they could have left themselves open for trouble. Elsewhere, the other notable movers were Lee Boyer and Les Ferdinand to West Ham. Christophe Dugarry to Birmingham. While Sam Allardyce hired a plane to bring three foreign players he hadn't even seen play. And Middlesbrough went for homegrown talent. The difference between staying up and going down into the Nationwide League in terms of TV money is so massive that hiring a plane, however much that costs, probably a maximum of, I don't know, £100,000 and probably much less, um, is worth it. Manchester United were once again leaving it late, scoring last-minute winners against Sunderland and Chelsea as their title challenge picked up speed. And Chelsea hit the headlines for the wrong reasons as their manager described their Stamford Bridge pitch as a beach. Meanwhile, in Lancashire, Graham Souness was quietly revitalising Blackburn Rovers and giving the club a real chance of qualifying for UEFA Cup football for the second season in a row. And it wasn't just the smaller sides that suffered as a result. Blackburn were laying some impressive campaign foundations. They were one of only two sides to beat the top three, the only team to beat Arsenal home and away. We've beaten Manchester United at home. And we've beaten Newcastle at home and we have both those teams to play. We've got the Newcastle game on Saturday, which will be a very, very difficult game. And then we're away to Man U shortly. So, you know, ask me after those games if we do well against the top teams. One huge factor in Rovers' success was Brad Friedel, the Premiership player's goalkeeper of the season. game um, it's a very humbling game and you have to keep your feet planted firmly on the ground and work as hard as you can every day if you don't do that then your performances will struggle on the weekend victory against Chelsea in February gave them a real chance the boss though wasn't getting carried away we're going okay at the moment but you know I've been in football a long time and the minute you start talking about how well you're doing you know, you're swiftly brought back down to earth. Rovers would eventually keep their rhythm to qualify for Europe in sixth place. If any match showed the golf in class between trophy winners and trophy seekers, it was February's match between Manchester City and Arsenal. The Gunners home and dry within 20 minutes. For Fulham supporters, one issue dominated the season. In the summer, the team moved to Loftus Road, pending a decision on the redevelopment of Craven Cottage. An impasse was reached when the club claimed their redevelopment plan was too expensive. For now, they're staying at Loftus Road for at least another season. There's no chance that the council are going to allow a ground share at Stamford Bridge in the long term. So where does Fulham Football Club go? Well, the obvious answer that means is out of Fulham altogether. And that's we've seen already with Wimbledon, the situation that can develop, and we end up playing miles away from Fulham and therefore not being Fulham Football Club anymore. And that's where the heart of the worries of fans comes from. Things weren't going to plan on the pitch either. After months of uncertainty over his future, Jean Tigonard was informed that his contract would not be renewed. And after a demoralising 4-0 defeat at home to Blackburn, it was decided to dispense with the Frenchman's services. A new man was in charge for the crucial visit of Newcastle. Chris Coleman would start a sequence of 10 points in five games, ensure Premiership survival and securing himself the job on a full-time basis in the process. Lewinsky with an absolute bullet! It's Lee Clark against his old club. Chris Coleman's men have stopped the rot at last. It's easy, isn't it? It's no problem. It's no problem at all. I could get the sack after Leeds if we get if we get thrown, but uh, no, I was going to enjoy it, and uh, you know we get ready for Leeds Tuesday. Two managers were locked together for most of the season and would be part of one of the tightest relegation scraps in Premier League history. Significantly for West Ham, the writing was on the wall very early. A two-goal lead against the champions wiped out with just minutes to spare. Massive disappointment in the dressing room afterwards when we let a late goal in to, to only take a point from the game. Uh, you know, Miss Lee people said before the game you'd have been happy with a point, but the way the game unfolded, we was unhappy. Defensive frailty would haunt them for the rest of the season.
Following a last-minute defeat at home to Southampton, the crowd's patience with Rhoda and club chairman Terence Brown finally snapped. The Hammers were fatefully bottom at Christmas. No team had ever survived with that dubious honour. Belief among the players, however, never wavered. A desperate win against West Brom in February started a run of results that gave the Hammers a chance of survival, however slim. But the pressure on Glen Rhoda would eventually tell. Sam Allardyce has always worn his heart on his sleeve and couldn't hide his disappointment as time and time again, precious points slipped away. We'd had a defence that hadn't, that hadn't achieved enough clean sheets uh, to uh, divert a 1-0 a victory uh, into three points. Nigerian international JJ Okocha was to prove one of Big Sam's greatest coups as Bolton continued to wheel and deal on a tight budget. I would have wished for us to be in a better position, but I'm not regretting anything because I'm having a great experience here. With JJ's help, the Wanderers were fighting tooth and nail. Along with West Ham, interest at the foot of the table would be kept alive until the very last moment. After their good early start, Middlesbrough were beginning to slip. They were finding it difficult to pick up any points away from home. But at the beginning of March, their favourite Brazilian, Janinho, was back after injury. And from then on, Middlesbrough just lost twice before the end of the season. With two months to go, Arsenal had a five-point lead over Manchester United. But Newcastle was still in contention thanks to their game in hand. Notably, Everton were above Liverpool. West Ham's recent run had given them a chance. Now Sunderland looked doomed. At this stage, no one in the bottom half was safe. And so, to the running. At the top, the challengers were keeping up the pressure on Arsenal. David Beckham scoring the winner at Villa. We need to win these matches, you know, to win the title. Uh, and if we do that, you know, we'll have a great, great chance. Later that day, Arsenal buckled at Blackburn. We play uh, four times at home and uh, I still believe it's uh, very much in our hands. Sunderland appointed Mick McCarthy, but he failed to win any of his nine games in charge. The team finished with the worst record in Premiership history. The man who started the season at Sunderland finished it at Leeds. Peter Reid was given eight games as caretaker manager after Venables was sacked. Reid's first game was at Liverpool, who were in a run of seven wins out of eight and continued their upward spiral here. Glenn Rhoda's West Ham were now really performing. Freddie Canute scoring the winner against Sunderland. It's nice uh, to be at the bottom three uh, tonight. Um, we know Bolton are playing on Monday and uh, we'll, we'll see how they get on against Tottenham. Bolton's response, a 1-0 win against Tottenham. At the top, the champions bouncing back after the slip against Blackburn were starting to push on again. United were getting stronger and stronger. They hadn't lost since December and now are pulverising arch-rivals Liverpool. At Villa Park, Arsenal were once again unable to put their opponents away and paying for it. The following weekend, with Arsenal not playing, Manchester United had the chance to go three points clear. Paul Scholes fired a hat-trick to end Newcastle's lingering title hopes. With six games or five games to go, there's always something where we think can happen. We've seen it time and time again. 
Christophe Dugarry would prove Birmingham's saviour. His first goal for the Blues confirming Sunderland's relegation. Now just two title contenders, one stunning showdown. The lead! And it's broken back to Cole. Stumbled, but keeps going. It's gone in! season at the bottom and one of the goals of the season from JJ Okocha but Bolton was still not safe it's a massive uh, gap for West Ham to catch up with only four games left it can be done over Easter the big two traded blow for blow United beating Blackburn Arsenal overcoming Borough the stresses of management all too evident Glenn Roder taken to hospital with a suspected stroke following a tense win over Middlesbrough Rhoda was to play no further part in West Ham's scrap for survival. Arsenal fans' worst fears were realised, as yet another lead was wiped out at Bolton. Here it is. Oh, that's brilliant. Franson. Well struck off the post. It's back to Jorka. And it's 2-1. There's hope yet for Bolton. Jorka with a free kick. Plenty of white shirts forward, they got it! And that's really like a knife into the heart of Arsene Wenger. Of course, it's not in our hands, and uh, we need now some good results for us. Sir Alex Ferguson knew the title was now Manchester United's to lose. His team never looked like faltering. West Ham legend Trevor Brooking took charge for the run-in and had a dream start. We kick off at three o'clock against Chelsea. Um, you know, they desperately need a win, I know that. Newcastle guaranteed Champions League football with victory over Birmingham. Liverpool slipped up at home to Manchester City, denied first by Peter Schmeichel and then by old boy Nicola Anelka. West Ham's final home game. Enter Paolo Di Canio and the most emotional scenes of the season. His goal ensured the last relegation place would be decided on the final day. Premiership record crowd of over 67,000 saw Manchester United thrash Charlton and put themselves on the brink. Sean in defence and against them. Third camp gave them hope. Two all with. Arsenal fans just couldn't believe it. You have to congratulate people who win it. You, nobody gives you the points, and I don't think we have thrown it away. We have lost today our second game uh, since December. So United confirmed as champions with a game to spare. The key issue, that fourth Champions League spot. It would all come down to a winner-take-all match at Stamford Bridge. Sunderland and West Brom were down, but the final relegation place was between West Ham and Bolton. The Hammers still in the drop zone. Leeds, Fulham and Villa were all now safe. And so to the final day, two main outstanding issues still to be resolved. West Ham travelled to Birmingham, having to better Bolton's result. A tense first half, it was nil-nil at half-time.
Kicking off at the same time, Bolton got off to a better start. Per Fransen easing the anxiety at the Reebok with a goal after 10 minutes. JJ Okocha scored a second to give them breathing space. At Stamford Bridge, final Champions League place. Captain Sammy Hoopier towered above Chelsea's defenders to... ...giving Jem and Ken Bates a much needed and much appreciated cash injection. A one outstanding question for the fans was the future of their hero, Gianfranco Zola. Was this goodbye? Chelsea's always been... Uh, first choice for me, honestly. Uh, but now it's, uh, it's time to celebrate, and uh, in a couple of days, in a few days, uh, we'll start thinking about the future. Second half at St Andrews. Les Ferdinand's header gave the Hammers renewed hope. Canute's shot against the post might have proved crucial, but then Birmingham struck back through Jeff Horsfield, and it looked all over. Could Di Canio work another miracle? Two minutes from time, and had Stern John sealed West Ham's fate? Di Canio did all he could, but now the Hammers had to wait for the result from the Reebok. Bolton old boy Michael Ricketts tried to spoil the party with a goal in the second half. But at the end of another nail-biting season, Bolton had survived again by the skin of their teeth on a day of vividly contrasting emotions. West Ham were relegated, the first team with over 40 points in the 20-team Premiership, but in truth, they'd given themselves too much to do. You always feared that uh, Bolton would win the home game. Um, so it's, uh, you know, Pretty despondent dressing room, but I don't think we could have asked any more from them today. You got the power from the board to change something. If you if you see, especially in our situation, we were at the bottom of the season, you have chances to change something. As West Ham was saying farewell to the Premiership, Bolton was saying goodbye to Goodney Bergson. And what a send-off. We got a little jittery in the second half and Michael scored that goal. And then, of course, you don't know how it will react once West Ham went 1-0 up. Uh, but we saw the game out really well. So there it is confirmed, but just three points above the relegation zone, Aston Villa's position forced Graham Taylor to resign. Birmingham enters the top Midland side. Leeds will surely hope for better. In the end, Manchester United won the title by five points. Newcastle and Chelsea claim the other two Champions League places. Liverpool and Blackburn will play in the UEFA Cup and they'll be joined by FA Cup finalist Southampton. Manchester United celebrated their championship with a 2-1 win over Everton. They turned an eight-point deficit in March to a five-point victory by May. A truly remarkable achievement. For Sir Alex Ferguson, it was his eighth Premiership crown in 11 seasons, and the one that he says he treasures most. His team were unbeaten since December, but the form of Ruud van Nistelrooy throughout the season was perhaps the deciding factor. 44 goals in all competitions, and 25 in the Barclaycard English Premier League won him the Golden Boot. But above all, it was a triumph of collective spirit. From Simon Reid and me, Steve Banyard, it's goodbye.